Well, good morning. It's good to see everybody out this morning. Thanks for being with us. And uh, we just appreciate if you're visiting with us, that you're here and you're sharing your time with us, and more importantly, worshiping the Lord with us. So we've got a few announcements this morning. I'll try to read them. Uh, I'm not trying to look like Clark Kent. Uh, I left my glasses at the house this morning, and these were in somebody's Sunday school room. And if they're yours, I appreciate you letting me borrow them for just a little bit. So I'm glad somebody left their glasses here instead at the house like me. So praise the Lord. And uh, I'll try to make do today. And I'll be re- re- back right tonight, hopefully. If you remember, we've got our Sunday uh, night or Sunday morning, Sunday uh, morning, Sunday school, 9.30 a.m., Wednesday Bible study, 7 p.m. We've got Awanas uh, for every age from the nursery right on up uh, to uh, the high schoolers. Today, 4.30 p.m., the choir will be practicing. So come on out for that. Today, uh, this evening at 6 p.m., uh, Christmas play practice uh, will be going on during our worship service uh, down in our other building. Uh, and we'll still uh, have our service up here, but we'll um, uh, getting close. We're getting close to uh, Christmas play, and we're excited about that. And this week, we're going to go Christmas caroling Tuesday. Um, 6 p.m. So try to be here as early as you can. And uh, we'll uh, team up. We may have enough. Last year we had so many people we could have probably sent two or three uh, choirs out. And we'll probably split up at least two groups um, and go out. We've got some baskets and we've got a list of uh, folks that we're going to visit and sing to and all. So we need a good crowd to show up for that to help us. So come on out for that. And then Thursday at 10 a.m., uh, the senior minister will be taking a trip to Southern Supreme. So if you have any questions, ask that man right there. He's got all the answers. And uh, now that we got to be there at 10. Yeah, here. So you need to be here at 9, 9, 9.15. Okay, good deal. 9.15, there's a sign-up sheet out in the hallway, uh, in that first hallway. So if you'd like to go, go ahead and sign up for that or, or see Brother Dave and he'll sign you up. Uh, also, there's uh, Saturday will be the dress rehearsal uh, for the Christmas play, so uh, make sure you attend that. And then, of course, Sunday uh, will be our regular service that morning, but that evening our Christmas play, and we're doing a little something different. We're uh, taking up some gifts for our, one of our uh, missions that we support, the Reach Out Crisis Pregnancy Center. And there's a list down here of diapers and things like that, and so I'm sure they could use all that and would appreciate the help, and that's been a great ministry for us to support and uh, saving lives and, and saving souls. So praise the Lord for them. And so we, we, we give God the glory for it. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we just thank you again. You're so good to us. And God, I just want to be faithful um, just to preach this morning what you'd have me to. I might uh, decrease and you might increase, Lord Father. And so I just pray you take over uh, everything that's done, Lord, the singing, the praying. Uh, everything, Lord, Father. Put a hedge around us and set our hearts and minds on you for the next little bit, Lord. We, we just love you, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Go ahead and stand, please, and grab your hymn book and turn to number 105. Oh, come all ye faithful, number 105. Brother Dave's going to come lead us.
Amen. <laughs> I thought that was yours. Ray said these were his. <laughs> Sorry about that, Ray. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. I'll get them back to you. <laughs> Amen. Let me say uh, also uh, last Sunday, I threw my back out carrying all the stuff that you got, Bailey. <laughs> and, uh, but she wants to thank you anyway. And uh, we thank you and we appreciate that. What a blessing. We had a uh, good. Uh, cattle trailer full of stuff we took home and so we took to her house and what she didn't need I, I might go back and take to my house I don't know <laughs> see in a few days but I can get out of there next time I visit but uh, some good stuff so thank you so much for it believe Miss Chrissy has our offertory and we'll have the ushers move on down the line and get over here <coughs> and receive the morning tithes and offerings praise the Lord for all the Lord has done for us and continues to do. We just give him the praise for laying that on people's hearts and people being obedient to give. And we just thank him so much. Let's pray. Lord, we just thank you again. You're so good to us. And God, now we're just praying for wisdom, Lord, Father, the discernment, Lord. We don't want to do anything that would uh, not be pleasing to you, Lord. And so we just... Uh, uh, I want to give you glory, Lord, and lift you up in everything that we do, Lord, Father, and you've supplied us so abundantly uh, above anything we could ever dream of, Lord, Father, and we just want to say thank you, and we love you, and we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. 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 Circle 
special music, and so I believe he's in the shoot, ready to go. Y'all give him a hand.
Good singing, Doug. Good singing, Chrissy. Choir, praise the Lord. What a blessing. Well, we're going to continue with our lighting of the Advent candles. And we started last week, and uh, we uh, do that as just kind of a uh, reminder of, of the, the great benefit and blessing of, of the incarnation, of the first Advent, the first coming. And we we'll look forward uh, to when he comes again. Amen. Yeah. Praise the Lord for it. And Todd and Jan Gaines and their family are going to do that today. So y'all give them a hand. week, we were reminded of the great promise the prophets made of the coming Messiah, the Lord Jesus. Just as they told us, he indeed was born of a virgin in the city of Bethlehem. During the second week of this Advent season, we look not only toward the great promise being fulfilled, but we also <coughs> recognize the praise and glory Jesus deserves. Luke 2, 8 through 15. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, everyone, into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth unto Judea unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was the house, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them and the glory of the Lord shone round about them and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto them, unto you, ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem, and see this thing which is come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. Let us pray. Lord, we praise you for humbling yourself and becoming a man that you might save us from our sins. We adore you and acknowledge that you and you alone are the Savior of this world. May we this Christmas never forget the real meaning of your birth. And Lord, we thank you for being our light in this dark world. Thank you for your many blessings. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. for our children's church, ages three to six, and our nurseries back there as well. Appreciate all you folks back there helping us and 
putting a word in these little ones. Praise the Lord. Well, let's take the Word of God this morning and turn to 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, chapter 2. Last week we preached a little bit to you, meddled in your business a little bit, and this Sunday we're going uh, to get our uh, teaching, I'm going to get my teaching hat on, try to, and so you might want to get a pen and make some notes in your Bible, or if you don't like to do that, get a piece of paper out, and uh, we're just going to interpret the Word, and uh, maybe straighten up a few things uh, that you might have seen in here that might that might be wrong that you've heard, and, and some of this stuff is used out of context, a couple verses in here, and we'll try to get all that straightened out, and then we'll make some application, and uh, I know the Lord will help us. Chapter 2. And I, and of course, anytime you see a conjunction there, that's simply connecting these two chapters. And so, if you recall, we were looking uh, at chapter 1, we looked at a couple different things, but we looked at the priority of preaching. And uh, we saw in verse 21 that it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. And we also looked a little bit at the provision uh, in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we saw in verse 30, uh, but of him are ye uh, in Christ Jesus, who of God has made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. And this and just simply connects this with what we've already saw um, as the Apostle Paul, as the Holy Spirit moves into right, uh, begins to bring this division uh, to the surface and begins to show them uh, the problems here and so we looked at that and this is just a continuation really of chapter 1 and chapter 2 is going to deal with the same thing but instead of the preaching and the provision it's looking specifically at the person and the work of the Holy Spirit as it relates to the Word of God. Now this is a very important chapter, not only in Corinthians, but in your Bible, uh, because it gives you this, although there's many aspects of the Holy Spirit, it gives you the aspect of the Holy Spirit as pertaining to you receiving the Word of God, okay? And so that's very important, because that's what we're here to do. We're here to listen to the preaching of the Word of God, and when we read the Word of God, we want to understand the Word of God, and I thank God that there's not a person in here that can't know the deep things of God's Word. Amen? Amen. You don't have to be a scholar. You don't have to, you don't have to be uh, educated uh, in theology or whatever uh, you want to call it. You, with the power of the Holy Spirit in you, can know God through His Word, through His revelation. So we're going to look at that. So this is a continuation. And it says, And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech, or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect or mature, yet not the wisdom of this world nor the princes of this world that come to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written... I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God has revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things 
of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man, which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man, but the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Let's pray. Lord, I pray you'd help us today. Lord, I pray you'd preach me, Lord Father. Put your words in my mouth. I don't, I don't want to do anything, Lord, or say anything, Lord Father, that wouldn't be pleasing to you. I pray you'd say some soul, Lord, you'd enlighten us, that you'd help us. And we love you and we thank you and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, in the strict context of what we're going to look at, we want to properly interpret what's going on here. And in the strict context, we're going to see how the Word of God came to us in the New Testament, which, is a, which will be a blessing for you. And so we're, going to, we're just going to study a little bit this morning on the intro. And so uh, if you love the Word of God and uh, you're hungry for that, you're going to enjoy this because it's been exciting for me this week. Uh, to look at some of this stuff again. Now, first thing I want you to notice is that the first five verses deal with uh, the Corinthian church, the people that were there, this local church, and their misplaced confidence in man. Now, Paul's already addressed some of this in chapter 1 where he said that, uh, uh, is, that he was, didn't come to baptize, he didn't come to... Uh, get in one of their cliques. The only thing he came to do was preach the Word of God. He didn't lift himself up, but he lifted the Savior up. And you'll notice that verse there that says, your face should not stand in the wisdom, this is verse 5, of men, but in the power of God. Now, in chapter 3, in the next chapter that we'll get to, let me just read you a couple of verse and, and show you why he's bringing this up now, and, I, and, and this will make it more evident. In chapter 3 of 1 Corinthians, verses 4 and 5, he says this, For while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are ye not carnal? Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos, but ministers by whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man? Now, there's division, and we've already seen that. One says this, one says that. One's thinking this, one's thinking that. The Bible was clear in chapter 1 as we studied that, that they had no discernment whatsoever. But there was also this factions within the church that was growing. One really liked the preaching of Apollos. He was a great orator, the Bible says in the book of Acts. He was a man of learned uh, knowledge and wisdom and obviously was talented at expounding the Word of God and pronouncing words, and, and he was just an orator. Now Paul says, look, I just came to you in weakness and in trembling, and my speech wasn't very excellent. In fact, it was uh, not much at all, and so that's an encouragement for me. When I hear myself speak <laughs> on recordings and stuff, I, I can relate to that. I struggle myself pronouncing words and articulating what I want to articulate, and some were of Apollos, and some were Paul, and some were Cephas, and, and, and other men that they were clinging to. And Paul says, I, 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 it's not a man that you should be clinging to. It's not a man you should be uh, dividing yourselves over, but you should be in unity around one man, the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. Right. Now, Paul says in verse 17 of chapter 1, if you remember that, he says, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. Now that should be made of none effect is really just one Greek word, and it means to be empty. It means to be void. It means to be in vain. In other words, Paul said, I purposely have determined in my heart 
not to come out here and, and, and do this, this shtick I have or present you with this gimmick or try to impress you with all my speaking skills and my knowledge because the only thing I can do, I can't help God's Word. The only thing I could do was really mess it up. And so that I want the power to lie in the simple Word of God in simplicity and, and in, in all the depths of it as the Holy Spirit of God takes that and applies it to your life. You don't need a show this morning. Now listen, I'm thankful for all the preachers that have had a, had a, had a good effect on me in my life. Aren't you, aren't you glad for good godly men that just stand up and preach the Word of God and say, Thus saith the Lord. I'm thankful for that. But they're just a man of like passions. They have nothing that they have received from the Holy Spirit that you haven't received. Okay? You got all the fullness of the Godhead bodily when you got saved and the Holy Spirit, by this divine chemistry of God, by that Holy Spirit imparted unto you the life of Jesus Christ and reveals to you the truth of His Word and brags on Jesus. Listen, anything that's going on in this church that takes attention to itself and not to Jesus is not from the Holy Spirit. It's not man. Listen, man likes man's thoughts and man wants the glory for himself. The Holy Spirit thanks the thoughts of God and brings glory and brags on Jesus Christ. That's what He's here for. And so I like this preacher and I like that preacher. There's nothing wrong with that. But I don't put my confidence in a man. Isaiah 55, 11 says this, So shall my word, okay, this is God, goeth forth out of my mouth, it shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereunto I sent it. He didn't say the word would come back to me, Brad. He said the word will go out and it'll come back to God, not void. In other words, he said, You don't even, listen, he said, Brad, you can preach all you want, not see a thing, it doesn't matter. You might not see no fruits come back to you, who cares? My word goes out that it won't come back to me, boy. God Himself. And so God's in complete control of His word. Man can't add to it. Uh, he can't take anything away from it. It goes out in the demonstration and power of that Holy Spirit. And so we don't get hung up on a man. Although men are, uh, thank God for preachers. Thank God that they, they're out there uh, preaching the word of God. But notice what it says there in that word that I just mentioned there. The word of God in verse 4 is not in man's wisdom or man's power, but it is the demonstration of the Spirit and of power. That, that word demonstration means to point out, to show, to make evident, to establish His word. Here's an illustration of what he's talking about here. Have you ever sit in a church like this or maybe at your house or wherever it was that you heard the preaching of the Word of God and you thought that preacher has hired a private eye to investigate what i got going on in my life. <laughs> There's just no doubt about it. Who has he been talking? Has he been talking to my wife? How does he know this? Listen, I don't know a thing. I don't want to know anything about you. I'm not, I don't regulate your life. I'm not looking in your refrigerator. I'm not digging up bones. I'm not looking in your closet. I don't want to know anything. Listen, when you get under conviction, if it's just a conviction that I brought about, it ain't doing you a lick of good. But I'm telling you, God knows what's going on in your life. And He can use, if, as I decrease... He increases. When I let Him control my mouth and He speaks the words He wants to speak, He'll enlighten. Listen, He's got the flashlight on your life. You're not hiding anything from Him. Don't get mad at me. I'm not trying to step on your toes. I'm just telling you what God says. And if God convicts you and God saves you, that'll be a good thing. I've got no converts. If, I, if you're converted on me, you're just lost and headed for hell. But if God gets a hold of you through His Word, through the power of the Holy Spirit, points out your loss and head it for hell, and you repent and believe, you'll be saved. Amen. And you'll have the same Spirit that I've got. 
And He'll begin to illuminate things in your life. Simple as that. If you're in here and you're saved and you're living in sin and the preacher comes up here, whether it be me or whatever, and begins to preach on what you're doing, listen, don't get mad at the preacher. Get mad at God. He already knows and He's convicting you. And if you'll humble yourself and turn to Him, He will forgive you and put you back in fellowship. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. That's the demonstration of power that no man can do but only God can do because He knows what you are. He knows what I am. He knows what you're doing. He knows what I'm doing. And He can reveal it. He's the only one that can. Notice what Paul says here in Philippians. For in chapter 3, verses 3 through 6. For we are the circumcision which worship God in the Spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, uh, verse 5 said, Our sufficiency is of God. Listen, I don't think I ought to let you down. God forbid that I would, but I will and I have. That's just the bottom line. I wouldn't want to do anything to put a stumbling block in front of you, but I probably will and have in the past. I'm a man of flesh, of like passion, just like you are. <coughs> and if you do something wrong, and you try to, and it be, listen, here's what I'm trying to say to you. You and your sin and your failing is not going to discourage my faith in God. You can fall by the wayside and I'll never see you again and you just fall out, I'm still going on. I might fall out and go by the wayside. If you're hung on a man, you might fall out with him, but if you're hung on God, you'll say, I'm staying with God. Man will fail, has failed, and he will, but God won't. Don't put your confidence, don't put your confidence in any man. You put it in God. You put it in Jesus Christ. He'll see you through. Paul said, you put your confidence in me, I'm going to let you down. I wouldn't want to let you down for nothing. Uh, but, I, but I'm going to. I just can't, it just can't help it. I can't live up to it. There's only one man that's ever lived up to it, and that's Jesus Christ. Right. Who's your confidence in this morning? Oh, we put our confidence in so much outside of God, it's, it's almost ridiculous, isn't it? Some of y'all got up watching the news this morning, you believed it. <laughs> sure you did just sad. Got no confidence in my flesh. I certainly got no confidence in your flesh. Paul said, our sufficiency is of God. <coughs> Secondly, Paul mentions here a mystery that was hidden that is now made manifest. Do you see that? Now, mystery, let me explain this. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, mystery in the New Testament is not like what you're thinking about. It's not like God's trying to keep it a mystery. A mystery in the New Testament is basically this. It's something that God has re revealed to us in, in shadow in the Old Testament. In other words, He's hinted to it. In other words, He's... put a type in there that we can, we can seek more clearly now that the New Testament is written because the New Testament is revealing this mystery. Amen. And so a mystery in the New Testament is not something that God wants to keep from you, but He wants to reveal it to you through His Word as the Holy Spirit, Scripture searches that and gives it to you. Now, let me, let me read you this verse here and then we'll get into it what I want to really focus on here right now. Romans 16, 25 through 26 says this. Now to him that is a power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, here's that word again, which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest and by the scripture of the prophets, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known 
to all nations for the obedience of faith. So those old prophets wrote the scripture by the moving of the Holy Spirit. And some of it was even veiled to them. They had little glimpses of Jesus Christ. They had types. They had shadows that pointed to this Messiah. But they didn't have the fullness of it yet. They didn't understand completely the church, for instance. And the rapture and things like that that you and I have because that mystery has been revealed to us by the Holy Spirit as He moved in the mind and the hands of the writers of the New Testament. Amen. Now this is very important because this little section here is as deep, theologically speaking, concerning the verbal plenary inspiration of the Scripture as any part of, of the Bible. In other words, this is the gist on how you and I receive the New Testament and that we know that it's God's Word and that you and I can understand it. Okay? So that's important. So let's, let's look at it. And let's just bear down on here just for a minute. Verse 9 and 10 again. Let's just start there. But as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard Neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God had prepared for them that love him. Now verse 9, the first time I heard that, I heard it at a funeral. And I've heard it preached many times concerning heaven. Anybody ever heard that quoted with heaven? And I, I see the application. There is some application there. I don't know if any mind of man could really comprehend the streets of gold, the city four square, the river of life, the absence of sin. It's really amazing. It's, it's, it's more than we can really grasp. And that's a great verse, but it doesn't have anything to do with that. Not one bit. Nothing. In the context, in the strict context that it's speaking, it's talking about the Word of God. It's talking about God's revealing through the Holy Spirit. Now let me read on. Now what's the next word in verse 10? But. But is a conjunction. It's a word of contrast. So first of all, no man can know it, but you can know it. No man can know it, but now you can know it. Notice what it says here. It says, but God hath revealed them unto us by His Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. Now that's a quote from Isaiah 64, 4 where it says, Since from the beginning of the world men have not heard, nor perceived by the ear, neither hath the eye seen, O God, besides thee, what he hath prepared for him that waiteth for him. So it has nothing to do with your future in heaven, although you can make application there. But that's not the strict interpretation according to the text. Amen? Well, don't get mad at me. You can still use that at funeral if you want to. And you can still talk about heaven like that. But it has everything to do with the here and now in your life. Because what it's talking about there is God's revelation to these men, okay? Notice these words here, and I want you to mark them. And this is the strict interpretation here, and then I'm going to make some application, okay? Now, I know this is study time, but I want you to get a hold of this. This will be important later on as you're studying and reading the Word of God. But God has revealed them unto who? Us. Mark that word. Verse 12, now, what? We have received, okay. Verse 13, which things also we speak, okay. Here, here, here's a strict sense here. He is talking about the men who wrote the New Testament in the strictest sense, okay. And he, here's what he's saying. He said, God has revealed those things those mysteries like propitiation and justification and sanctification and redemption and ransom and all these big, deep theological topics and words that we talk about, he said they've, that to us, these apostles, these writers of the New Testament, God had revealed them to them. And now... They're revealing them through their words. They're preaching that everywhere they go. They're preaching Christ crucified. 
Now remember, that you hadn't got the complete New Testament at the time of this writing, okay? Amen? So these guys were preaching what God had already revealed to them, and they were using their words to preach what God had said to them. So that God was saying to them, this is the message. They were preaching it everywhere they went. He had preached it at Corinth, he said. The apostle uh, Peter was preaching where he went. All these guys were preaching, okay? Before anything is written down and comes together in the canon of the New Testament, these guys are preaching this great truth. Amen? Now, so revelation is God disclosing His truth to these men. Okay? Now the next thought He's going through, okay, follow this, there's three things here. The next thing He's going to tell us about is what we could refer to as inspiration. Okay? Inspiration. The Bible is an inspired book. Amen? There's no mistakes in it. You might think you found one, but you hadn't. Okay? I'm just telling you. There's no mistakes in it. It's inerrant. It's all powerful. Okay? It is the Word of God. It is not the thoughts of men about God. Can you see the difference there? I could write a book, and many books are written today, and you can make thoughts about God, but that wouldn't be God's Word. And thoughts about God that man had, that's not God's inspired Word. That's not inspiration. Okay, that's just guys trying to sell you books that are wrong. Now I've talked, y'all gonna get me going on this. <coughs> Half of y'all bought this book back in 88 where it said 88 reasons the Lord's coming in 88. <laughs> and it didn't come, and the guy the next year wrote 89 reasons, and you went back and bought that one. That's not inspiration. Amen? That's not. That's fanciful stuff. That's like all those books down here at these bookstores and stuff. A lot of that's just fanciful stuff. It's not the inspired Word of God. So revelation came to these men and they began to preach the Word. But then inspiration came to them and inspiration is God seeing that His revelation is recorded on paper by man's hand as He writes through Him. Everybody with me on that? God revealed it. They preached it. God gave them also inspiration, which is them writing down the Word of God. Every letter is from God. Okay? There's no mistakes in it. It's not them just going out there and saying, well, this is what I know to be true about God and I'm just going to write any way I want to. No, this is God moving their mind through their arm to their hand and writing down every I and every T, every letter. It is the Word of God. If it's not, then we're here for nothing. And it is referred to as inspiration. Now, I want to read you something difficult here. It's a difficult word in the Greek, but luckily I figured it out. <clears throat> Nobody else could, but I did. Thank the Lord. 1 <laughs> Corinthians 2, verse 13. Take a gander at it. Which things also we speak, that's what they were doing, preaching and speaking, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost teaches, comparing, mark that word comparing, spiritual things with spiritual. Now, that word comparing is, is a difficult word, but let me explain it this way to you. <clears throat> well, we think of comparing, we may compare some, you know, this car and this car. Maybe compare the, the tread on this tire with the tread on this tire. We're comparing this, we're comparing that. Not, not exactly what that word would be here in the context. And not to give you a class on Greek, you don't need to know any of that to know your Bible. Amen? But it has the idea of fitting <coughs> together in this context. You're taking one thing and you're fitting it with the other. And this is important because here's what inspiration was. After the revelation, God took, here's what he's saying, God took spiritual truths that he had revealed and in inspiration, he took those spiritual truths and he fixed them 
with spiritual words. In other words, he took the spiritual truth and compared it with spiritual things, a spiritual word, and so that the revelation now is put on paper by the Holy Spirit. It's not the word Paul said ought to go in there. It's the word God said ought to go in there. Now all these men, listen, this is, this is amazing. 66 books in the Bible. There's 39 in the Old Testament. That leaves how many in the New Testament? If you're from Cameron, you could never, you could never work that out in the time we got left. You ain't got enough toes and fingers. So 39 in the Old Testament, 27 in the New Testament, dozens of authors written hundreds of years apart, and yet not a single mistake. Some of them, listen, all of them spoke a different dialect. Some were from up north, they're Yankees. Some were from down south. They're rednecks. They had different slang and all. And God took their vocabulary. And as they wrote, He said, this is the word I want there. This is the exact spiritual word that will match up with my spiritual truth. And I'll put them together. And so now you've got revelation in preaching and you got inspiration on a page. I'm excited. If you're a student of the Bible, you ought to be excited about this context here because it's absolutely phenomenal. It's amazing. The Holy Spirit was in charge of that. And the Holy Spirit did that. And the Holy Spirit is in charge of the preaching of the Word that I'm preaching right now. And if I'll get out of the way enough and I'll decrease enough, God will increase and He'll shine that light on what you got going on in your life. And He'll reveal things to you. Now, let's go on to the last thing. Revelation. Inspiration. That's how you got your Bible. Amen? And that, doesn't that assure you? Doesn't that give you confidence? It does me. It's, it's very wonderful to think about. Now, this next part, this spirit of illumination, this is what He does. He reveals truth. He makes it enlightened to your mind if you have the Holy Spirit so that you can understand God's Word. The deep things of God. There is no longer... Now this is important because if you use these verses out of context, which a lot of people do, you're going to be... You could be fooled easily because there is no more revelation and inspiration going on. Let me say that again. There's no more revelation and there's no more inspiration going on. You come to me and you say you're a prophet or you're a prophetess. And as you got some insight... Some new stuff that God has given you? Okay. Back at you. Good. No, you don't. When He closed the New Testament canon of Scripture, that was it. Amen. I know if you're a Mormon, you got another thing. That's not from God, friend. Amen. He closed her down right there. So don't come and tell me how spiritual you are and God has revealed some new things to you and He's inspired you to write it down on a piece of paper and you want $20 for your book, forget it. It's not, that's not going on anymore. Well, some of you, <laughs> there must be some prophets out here <laughs> getting offended. You've done got some revelation. You can call yourself whatever you want. Apostle, you're not. Prophet, you're not. Prophetess, you're not. Well, maybe. <laughs> Little Jamie, she can, she can, she can predict what I'm going to do. I can tell you that. <laughs> so there may be something rubbing off on her. I don't mess with her much. She already knows uh, she's one step ahead of me. So those two things are done with. Yeah. Amen. Amen. You, er, amen. So everybody say amen. 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 Don't fall for that. Don't fall for that. That's nonsense. Man, come up behind us. God showed me something He's never showed anybody else in His Word. Come on. Come on. I told you I heard preaching one time. Back when I was a young preacher, and 
I'd never heard anything like it before. I said, man, that, that dude is a prophet. I said, I've never heard it. This is the greatest preacher ever was. Years later, I read it in a Matthew Henry commentary that wrote four, in 1476 or something. It's all been preached before, friend. That stuff ain't going on no more. Inspiration, revelation. But what is going on and continues to go on is illumination. That's the faculty of the Holy Spirit and His Word that goes on even right now and will go on. He will enlighten God's Word so that you can understand what God is saying and you can understand the very deep, deep things of God. Everyone in here who's saved, I don't care if you went to sixth grade or didn't go to school at all like my grandparents did, you make an X for your... I don't, listen, I don't know what it is, but the Holy Spirit, if that's in you, you have the ability to know everything that anybody else has ever known because you have everything that everybody else has ever had that's saved, and that's the Holy Spirit. It's a, it's a great encouragement to me, and it, it should be to you that I can take the Bible out and I can begin to read it. And it, listen, now when I say that, can, we, can I go a few more minutes? Is that okay? I know it's late and the Methodist is beating us to Cracker Barrel and all that. We'll let them have it this Sunday. Listen to me. Listen to me. With that said, I don't want you to ever get the idea that you can, that you can approach the Word of God and be slothful. The Bible says study to show yourself approved. Okay? Meditating on the Word. The Holy Spirit is not going to let you be lazy with that Word. If you want knowledge, if you want wisdom, God will certainly grant that. He'll certainly reveal things to you and enlighten things would be the better word. Enlighten things that, he's, that He has in His Word as we get into His Word. And that's something that He says here that only people that are saved can do. The natural man can't receive it. The only thing the natural man can receive is simply this, that he is a sinner and that he is lost and that he is under God's condemnation. And the Holy Spirit will take that, 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 that bit of information there and begin to work in his spirit. If there's someone lost out here right now, God is taking that word and he is applying it to your heart he is putting you under conviction. He is making you uncomfortable. He, you feel like the spotlight is on you. And I'm telling you, it is on you. And you're condemned. It's not how good you are. It's how bad you are, friend. You're not going to work your way. You're not going to pay your way. There's nothing you can do outside of receiving the grace by faith that Jesus Christ so readily wants to offer you. It's not your parents' membership. It's not their goodness. It's not their salvation. It's a personal thing with you. And if God's convicting you, He's saying, right now, don't hesitate. Don't wait. You need to get saved. But for you and I that are saved, we can begin to be enlightened and grow Something that the natural man, which is a lost man, can't do because they're spiritually discerned. Now let me say this about the Holy Spirit, which is a study in and of itself that could go on for endlessly. But John 16, 13, how be it, this is Jesus Himself talking about the comforter that He'll send, the Holy Spirit, which is God. He's God the Father, He's God the Son, He's God the Holy Spirit. Howbeit when He, personal pronoun one, the Spirit of truth has come, He, too, will guide you unto all truth, for He shall not speak of Himself, but whosoever He shall hear, that shall He speak, and He will show you things to come. Six times in that one verse, He uses a personal pronoun, He. <coughs> he didn't say it. He didn't say she. Or he didn't say in between. That might be in some new translation, but it's not in this one. Now listen, the Holy Spirit is not Casper the ghost floating around. He's not an outside force. He is a person. You say, well, if He's a spirit, how can He be a person? You are a person because of who you are on the inside. Your personality. In other words, the mind, the, 
the, the, the, the, the emotions that you have, the will that you have. That, that's your inner man, your personality. The body just simply communicates what you are in, on the inside. This body is not who you are. Thank God for some of us. <laughs> and so the Holy Spirit is a personality. He's a person. It's a pronoun. It's a he. It is God. And when you get saved, He makes your body His residence. The Bible says you are a temple of God. He comes in to the Spirit that He, that he made in you. That's, it. That's where He lives. Okay, So He can gain access to you in every part of your life. So it's God's life imparted unto you by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's, it's very supernatural. And yet it's very true. And so He's not an outside force, but a person. And which leads me to my last point. He has imparted to you the mind, in verse 16, of Christ. Mm-hmm. Now, that's simply... The mind of Christ is simply... Here's an easy way to think of it. Imparting to you the mind of Christ because He's imparted to you the life of Christ. The life of God in you, Christ in you, the hope of glory. He didn't come in to fix up your old life. He didn't do that. He came to give you a new life. His life. You say, I want to give my life to Christ. He doesn't want it. He's already seen it. He said, your life's got to go. I've got to destroy it. You've got to die. Isn't that right? The wages of sin is dead. That's not, that's not the Holy Spirit imparting to you. The Holy Spirit comes into you not to fix up your old life. That can't be done. He's come to impart a new life. God's life in you. That's why you're struggling right now. You're trying to still do, do all this religious activity in your life, in your flesh, and it can't be done. It can't be done. The only life that ever pleased God was His own life. And it will only please Him. And so He parts His mind to us that we would see things from the perspective of God. Now, I don't know what you got going on in your life. It's been a great week for me to study that. I don't know if you've lost confidence. We'll go ahead and stand. Just as I am, I think is what we got on the altar call. Number 562. If you want to stand and grab your hymn book. I don't know what you're putting your confidence in and your confidence is shaking, it's probably because it's in the wrong thing. you got something going on in your life and you've had 12 people on Facebook give you the answer on how to fix it. <laughs> <coughs> that ain't going to work. You need to put your confidence in God's plan and His Word. Maybe you're in here and you're a Christian. You're rattled this morning. you got problems all over the place. You've lost your confidence. I'm telling you, put your confidence in the Lord Jesus. He can calm you down, work in your life. Maybe you, you're in here this morning, you are lost. You, you're right. I don't, you don't understand anything about God. It's all confused. That don't matter. You don't got to understand anything. Just understand this. God loves you. He sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to take your place. He died on a cross for you, shed His blood. Three days later, He rose again. He said, whosoever call upon my name shall be saved. And He'll seal you. And then He'll take that Holy Spirit and begin to make you into the image of His dear Son. Maybe you need that this morning. Maybe you just need wisdom and you need that mind of Christ. He can do that through His Word, through the power of His Holy Spirit. Whatever you need this morning, you come as we sing very quickly, just as I am. Number 562. Thank you for this water, bro. You come, 562.
Very quickly. Why is this important? Because this is the Word of God, friend. And everything in here is backed by the very character of the one who wrote it, God Himself. He cannot lie. He will do exactly what He said He's going to do. He loves you. He cares for you. I don't know what's going on in your life. And maybe you've lost confidence, but I'm telling you, you can have confidence in this right here. You come very quickly. Maybe you're lost in here. We won't labor the point. Friend, you need to stop trying. You just need to come to Him. Give all this mess up. Stop trying to fix yourself. You can't fix it. Your flesh will never be fixed. You need His imparted life. He'll do that. Let's sing one more verse. One more verse. You come if you're lost in here. This last verse very quickly. Be worried about somebody beside you. They probably need worse than you do. You come. Thank you. What a, a great chapter, and uh, I hope that encouraged you. I have uh, went over. I hadn't done that in a couple Sundays. Not this bad, but uh, so praise the Lord. Uh, I'll try to cut y'all short tonight. I'll take the 15 minutes off tonight to make it right or whatever. So anyway, praise the Lord. Come back tonight. We'll be in the book of Joshua. Uh, chapter 7 is a great book. It's AI. It's Aiken. Uh, it's some good stuff in there. We'll hit it right quick and, and, and uh, look forward to the Lord helping us glean on that. Thank you for being with us this morning. Uh, if you're visiting, come back with us. Uh, be back tonight. I encourage you to do that. Uh, we, we just thank you so much. You're so good to us. And uh, praise His holy name. Tyler, how about close us with a word of prayer?